Welcome. Thank you for being here. If you wouldn't mind giving us a like and consider going ahead and subscribing as well, that would be fantastic. And if you really want to go the extra mile, go down to the description below and click the Patreon link. Lots of cool stuff going on there. As always, I love you and enjoy the show, guys. The Deathworlders, a story by user Hambone. Chapter 22, Warhorse, Part 1, First Year, Part 2. Date point, Boxing Day, four years, eleven months, and two weeks after Vancouver. Adam Ares. Adam wasn't yet asleep, but it still took him a couple of seconds to register the knock on his door. He sat up a bit. Ava? She called through the door. Can I come in? Sure. She'd left the hall light on and leaned against the doorframe, backlit by it, and Adam had to employ some willpower not to stare. She was wearing what looked a lot like one of his t-shirts, a thin white one. The shirt itself wasn't blocking any of the light from behind her, and the varying depth of shadow her body made under it was. He sat up some more and leaned forward to try and hide what the view did to him, discreetly bunching a little more blanket on his lap. There wasn't anywhere else to look, though, without actually looking away from her. If he looked down, then he had to contend with her legs, and as for her face, there was an expression there he couldn't really read, a dark and intense one. Hey, uh he said. You okay? It's after midnight, she said. Oh, uh, happy birthday. She looked like she was about to say something, then she shook her head, stepped onto the bed, and hugged him. Can I sleep here tonight? she asked. He scooted over and she dug herself under the blankets and wriggled into his chest. He smoothed her hair out of the way. You okay? I just... She looked up and kissed him. It's going to be tough not having you around. He put a hand on the back of her head and held her. That's going to be the toughest bit, he agreed. You'll write me? Every chance I get. She puffed out a huge rush of air into his chest and snuggled up against him, even closer. I love you. It was a phrase they rarely uttered. A vulnerable, weak little phrase, really. But that just meant it had so much more meaning for them. And I love you, he promised. He could feel her smile against his chest and the way she relaxed and fell asleep. She was still there in the morning when he woke up. Date point. Four years, eleven months, and four weeks after Vancouver. Seattle, Washington, USA, Earth. Adam Aries. Leaving home had been hard. Traveling alone and sleeping alone in an unfamiliar hotel room in an unfamiliar city full of the kind of traffic that reminded him painfully of San Diego, and which he'd grown accustomed to the absence of in Folktha, hadn't made for a good night's sleep. That, and it was cold. January in Seattle versus early summer in Folktha had been an unwelcome introduction to the joys of a freezing gray drizzle that seemed to come right off Puget Sound, bent on freezing the whole city. 
He'd been tempted to dive for the warmth of his hotel room the second he got off the plane, but instead he used the hours of daylight and went straight from the airport to the USAF recruiting office. That part turned out to be easy. He was in and out inside an hour or so, having practically had documents thrust into his hands along with instructions to attend the military entrance processing station the next morning. Apparently, the recruiter had been impressed. For lack of anything better to do, he took a walk and saw the sights. He'd have preferred to jog, but he'd worn his good chinos to make an impression for the recruiter. He didn't watch the people at first. He watched the architecture in the city, taking in the square, glassy grayness and the scratchy trees that were no more than bare twigs in the winter. The overcast sky, openness of the street plan, and the whir of bicycles. The traffic was familiar, but the city it crawled around in couldn't have been more different. Cold though it was, he could see that the plants which seemed to be all over everything would actually fit here, rather than being aliens imported and maintained at great effort. Of course, Seattle meant Starbucks. He knew that much, and eventually he dropped in on the one on Fifth Avenue, in the shadow of the monolithic Black Columbia Center. Mercifully, it was quite warm inside, and he shucked off his jacket, the rugged all-weather one that most Cimbrian colonists had with the From Ashes patch that only Ava shared. He tugged at the t-shirt he was wearing underneath, aware that it was an old one that nowadays was stretched tight across his chest and shoulders. It was a good shirt for showing off the gym-fit physique he'd picked up training with Legsy, but not exactly comfortable. The people-watching skills that Gabriel had taught him prodded him a second or so later, alerting him to a change. It was subtle. The young mother in line in front of him had shepherded her kids forward and was now keeping them in front of the stroller. The older man in the gray suit next to him scooted his chair forward and around the table a little. The barista, on the other hand, was almost certainly sneaking sly glances at him down the counter. He tried to ignore it, studying the menu as they crawled toward the counter. But it was difficult to ignore that the people who joined the line behind him left arm's length at least nor the snippet of conversation he could just hear from a middle-aged couple by the door. No, I, I don't think so. He doesn't have any tattoos. That shocked him, upset and surprised him. He fumbled his way through a clumsy order for a simple latte, left the change for a tip, and made himself scarce. His return walk to the hotel was a solemn and thoughtful one, which he spent, rather than looking up at the buildings, looking down at his feet lost in thought and trying to ignore the way people veered out of his path on the sidewalk. In the end, he spent the evening lurking in his hotel room, playing free games on his phone. The weather, if anything, got even more dismal overnight, which was in its own way fortunate because he barely slept, and an early morning jog in the bracing Washington weather did more to get him alert and ready than all the coffee in Columbia. Once wearing clean and dry clothes, he caught a cab to the MEPS, which turned out to be just one small part of a huge building behind a wall of hedges and trees, by the railroad track and just north of the airport. It wasn't what he'd pictured, but he trusted the cab driver, so he refused to allow himself to dither outside. He headed straight in after paying the fare. Inside, it wasn't what he'd anticipated either. He'd envisioned more of the posters and macho imagery that had decorated the recruiting office. What he instead got was a reception desk in a fairly bland office space, there were flags and crests up and a general clean and efficient air, but if not for the uniforms, he might have been in a civilian workplace. The reception desk didn't actually have a human on it, just a series of touchscreens which, on being prodded, walked him through a quick and simple series of questions about who he was and what he planned on becoming. Asked him to scan the barcode on the form the recruiter had given him, and then directed him to a printer which spat out a sticker with a QR code and his name on it. Thanked him and directed him to wait. There were a lot of chairs for that. Adam paced, pausing to grab meager cups of water from the cooler in the corner. He'd barely been there for five minutes before he started to feel like a zoo lion. He might have been there half the day before anything interesting started to happen. A handful of people were sitting and fidgeting alongside him, most about his age and with their parents in tow, before he was called and directed to a station where he filled in a form. Then he went back and waited. Then he was called to another station where they asked him some questions. Then he went back and waited. Again and again. By the time it was done, he felt both as if he'd never stopped moving and also as if nothing at all had happened. He had no idea if it was afternoon or full evening yet, 
But eventually, he was sat down opposite a handsome man in a blue shirt with the five stripes of a technical sergeant on his sleeve and the surname Foster on his chest, and had his hand shaken. So, you want to be a pararescuman? the sergeant asked, sitting down. I do, Adam agreed. Why? The unit motto speaks to me, that others may live. When Foster just waited patiently, he felt drawn to elaborate. I've... I'm from San Diego, originally. I've lost people, and I guess I want to keep others from having to experience that. Have you considered alternatives? Sure, but that's my first choice, Adam said. What alternatives did you consider? I guess security, force protection, medic, that kind of thing, you know? I was thinking of being a cop like my dad before I decided to do this. Was there any specific event that changed your mind there? Adam nodded. My friend was murdered. Sarah Tisdale? On Cimbrian? I heard it was a big story back here on Earth for a while. Foster nodded. You have my condolences, he said. But why did that change your mind about your choice of career? Adam took a deep breath worried that what he was about to say might sound paranoid or crazy and ruin his chances then and there. But Powell's advice had been impossible to misinterpret. Speak honestly, always. I think... I think there's a pattern at work, he said. Like everyone knows that San Diego was destroyed by antimatter. It was in the official investigation's report but nobody has that much antimatter on Earth, so there have to be aliens involved somehow. And who else would want to sabotage Folktha's spaceport like the guy who shot Sarah was trying to? Well, I think that the military knows who's behind it, and I want in. I want to stop them from hurting anybody else. Hmm. Foster stood up. Stand up. Let me have a look at you. Adam did so. Look at me, Foster continued. Raise your arms above your head. Adam did so, patiently awaiting an explanation. He didn't get one. Foster just gestured toward a pull-up bar. See that? Get up on it and show me what you've got. Adam almost laughed. He'd been doing reps alongside Legsy in 1.15G in Folkfa's variable gravity gym for the last month. He shook his limbs loose, reached up, got his form strictly correct, and set to. He hadn't even started to feel the burn yet when Foster interrupted him. Oh, okay, okay, get off that thing, put this on, and start over. This turned out to be a heavy weighted vest. Adam shrugged it on, got back on the bar, and resumed his pull ups. He was finally starting to feel some heat in his muscles when Foster spoke again. So why you? Adam dropped off the bar and turned to face him. Foster shook his head. I didn't tell you to stop, son, he chided. Get back up there and keep going. Sorry. Foster watched him resume his form. So, why you? He asked. What do you mean? Adam asked him. It's a simple question, son. Why you? Why do you think you want this? Why do you think pararescue is the right one for you? Well, like I said, the motto. Okay, well, what makes you think you're right for pararescue? Adam's brow creased as he really started to feel his muscles working. The weighted vest was making all the difference. I'm going to work damn hard for this, he said. If I have to stay on this, he grunted, bar till I'm twenty to prove it, I damn well will. You think you can work that hard? I no! The exertion finally started to choke off Adam's words. Yeah! I can, he finished between pulls. Foster nodded again and watched him for a few more before finally raising a hand. All right, rest up. Adam lowered himself slowly down this time and massaged his hands. Foster handed him a cold glass of water as he sat down, which Adam gulped down in one as the sergeant jotted a few short observations. All right, I think I'm done with you for now, Foster said. 
You'll need to go on through to the rest of the MEPS, get your tests done and all that stuff, but assuming there's no problems there, you'll be coming back here tomorrow to speak with the Special Forces recruiter. Adam beamed. Thank you, he said. How'd you get here? Cab? Where are you staying? Adam told him and Foster nodded. Right. We'll pick up the bill from here on in as well as transport. I'll see you later on today once you're done with all your tests. The rest of the day passed in a blur for Adam. He was measured, weighed, had samples of blood, hair, and saliva taken, asked to walk around with one foot on tiptoe, had puffs of air shot into his eyes by a machine, spent some minutes with another machine pressing a button whenever he saw lights in his peripheral vision, a few minutes in a dental chair, filled in forms, answered questions, took tests. Even the business-like intimacy of the full medical examination didn't faze him. The important part was that he was past the first hurdle. Technical Sergeant George Foster. Okay, next up for review is Adam Aries. Permanent address, 20 Delaney Roll, Folktha. Symbrian. Huh. Yeah, we've got ourselves a space cadet here, somebody joked. Space cadet he may be, but he's the real deal, Foster commented. I put him on the bar, stopped counting at 50. He says he was training in supergravity for a month before coming down here. Looks like the British Special Forces garrison took him under their wing. Their CO gave him a reference. What's it say? Pretty typically British, really. The sergeant with that file examined the letter. To blah blah, I'm sending this young man your way with my professional opinion that he may be of some use to you. Yours sincerely, Captain Owen Powell, etc. and letter. She smiled, folding it up again. You've gotta love the Brits, right? Isn't Powell the SBS officer behind the SOR program? Foster asked. If he is, then that's a glowing reference right there. That's right. Well, his opinion seems on the money. The kid's already fit and strong, and he's got exactly the right build for a PJ. So, unless there's anything wrong with him, Doc? The chief medical examiner studied his own copy of the candidate's notes. His blood work showed a lot of testosterone, he commented. But I chalk that up to him being young, fit, and eager to prove himself. I see no reason to suspect steroids or substance abuse. His mother died young in the San Diego blast, so there's no way to know his medical history from her. There's a history of glaucoma and coronary artery disease from his paternal grandparents, but his ECG and intraocular pressures were all fine today. No concerns. Foster turned to the staff psychologist. Lieutenant Schumann. Doctor? He's... Angry, Schumann concluded, examining his notes. But he's channeling it well. It's motivating him healthily. He's got a long-term, steady girlfriend, and he's come to us. That shows drive and an ability to emotionally commit, and that month of hard training proves that this wasn't a spur-of-the-moment decision. He's thought about this and prepared for it. He's maybe not the most introspective young man I've ever met, but he's also not lacking in intelligence. Overall, he's calm, pleasant, confident, intelligent, and well-adjusted, with plenty of healthy aggression. I think he's an excellent candidate. Guess he's one for you, then, Foster commented, turning to Master Sergeant Wood, the Special Forces recruiter. Absolutely, Wood agreed. He's a strong PJ candidate. But he's maybe even good enough for the SOR program. You think? It can't be an accident that this Captain Powell gave him a reference like that, Wood noted. We'll see how he does tomorrow. They moved on to the next candidate. Date point. First contact day. Five years after Vancouver. Seattle, Washington, USA, Earth. Adam Aries. A car came to pick him up, rather than the taxi he'd taken the day before. It wasn't raining this morning, but the wind was still cold enough to sting the ears, even through his Gore-Tex beanie. The driver parked up and got out of the car, which surprised him, as did the fact that he was wearing sports gear rather than USAF blue. Adam Marys? That's me. The driver shook his hand. Master Sergeant Tony Wood, USAF Special Forces recruiter, he said, producing a card to verify his identity. Oh, I, uh, thought I'd be meeting you at the, uh, MEPS, Master Sergeant. You can just call me Sergeant, son. I figured I'd get a look at you in motion. You up to go for a jog? Sure. Adam had already taken a morning jog, but it had been barely more than a warm-up and stretch. 
anticipating a day of being put through his paces. He suspected that Wood had something a little more strenuous in mind. And so it proved. That month of training with Legsy paid off. Jogging on Earth with no load was different to jogging on Cimbrian with a heavy bag to compensate for the gravity difference. In many ways, it was easier. But Wood was a tall man with a long, easy stride that ate up the ground. Forcing Adam to take three steps for every two of the sergeants just in order to keep pace. Weirdly, the questions he'd been preparing for didn't materialize. They just did a double loop round some of the interesting parts of downtown before returning to the car. And Adam's ego wilted a little when he noticed that Wood, although he was steaming up the air with regular working breaths, had obviously found the run much easier than he had. Clearly, he still had a lot of fitness to gain to really make the grade. Not bad. You ain't fast, but next to some of the other kids I've seen. Wood congratulated him. Thank you, Sergeant. Wood thumb pointed to the hotel. If you want to change, I'll wait in the car. Can I shower, too? Sure. Make it quick, though. We've got a lot to cram in today. Adam nodded and ran back to his room for a quick rinse, dry, and change job. Sure enough, when he got back to the car, Wood was pocketing an old-fashioned digital stopwatch. He made a mental note. Everything is a test. Wood didn't comment as he climbed in, just put an arm on the back of the seat to turn and reverse out of the parking bay, then merged into city traffic. So, pararescue, he said. I was a combat controller myself, the brother unit. We got a lot of respect for the PJs. The training's hell, but they do a heck of a job. Captain Powell said they call it Superman School, Adam volunteered. That they do. Wood took a right turn. Now, in all honesty, this is something I don't say to most candidates. I think you've got what it takes to pass it. He turned right again. Thank you. Adam tried not to smile. Well, hear me out. Wood took a third right turn. Adam wasn't sure if he had a destination in mind. The route was such an inefficient one that he suspected the sergeant was just driving for the sake of keeping them moving. Fortunately, he didn't turn right again, but sat back and relaxed on a long straight. What if I could offer you something more? He asked. More? Check in the glove box. There's a tablet in there. Adam did so. When he swiped to turn it on, it filled with what was clearly a form of some kind. What's this? Non-disclosure agreement. Wood revealed. You need to read it in full, sign, and give a verbal signature. But the gist of it is that what I'm about to tell you is classified information, and you'll be liable to federal prosecution if you discuss it with unauthorized persons. Okay. Adam read the document in full, twice, then wrote and signed his name and, when prompted, carefully enunciated the script that the form displayed for him. I... Adam Miguel Angel Ares, solemnly affirm that I agree to be bound by the terms and conditions of this non-disclosure agreement. Wood nodded. There's a program in the works, something that your Captain Powell had a hand in masterminding, he said. There is? Yep. There was a space battle over Cimbrian about four months ago. You know about it? Adam nodded. Yeah. Well, Captain Powell and the commanding officers of the two ships involved, HMS Myrmidon and HMS Caledonia, they made a recommendation to the British Ministry of Defense that specialist skills and training were going to be required to form the basis of infantry operations in space. The MOD decided to share the idea with the DOD, and from there it got bumped all around the coalition, and it's becoming a joint allied venture. He took a left turn. It's being called the Spaceborne Operations Regiment, or SOR. Currently, it doesn't even really exist, doesn't have any men. The spacesuits they'd wear are still being designed, but we know two things about it. The first being that its primary mandate will be frontline combat operations against the alien organization which, you're right, nuked San Diego and murdered your friend. So it's real? Yep. That's as much as I can tell you for now, even under NDA. You're not cleared for the details. But you are right. We're fighting a war right now, and the SOR are going to be the guns in that fight. All right. What's the other thing? Training will be four years, minimum. And you'll be under contract for at least four years after that. So this would be at least an eight-year commitment if you took it. 
that's... that's an awful long time. Yep, Wood agreed. We had to jump through hoops to get that contract approved. Would they be doing stuff other than fighting these aliens? Anti-piracy operations, counter-hunter operations. Most of the time, you'd be operating exactly like any pararescuement under the aegis of the USAF. So search and rescue of life rafts and broken ships, humanitarian aid, emergency medicine. Finally, you'd be a qualified astronaut, and that means you might wind up spending some time on the ISS in some capacity. Anything else? Wood's jaw moved thoughtfully. Yes, he said eventually. We think we're going to have to put the candidates on an extremely intensive physical track. You are? An armored spacesuit is going to be dang heavy, Wood explained. Every trick to make it less so is being considered, but the fact is that spaceborne operators are going to have to be strong, and you especially, if you're falling into the role of spaceborne pararescue. You'll need to be able to carry all your gear plus one of your buddies with his gear and suit across long distances. And given the weights involved, we're not actually sure that getting you that strong that quickly will even be possible, let alone wise. It can be done, though? Sure. The numbers are within the limits of what's humanly possible, but if we're going to get you that strong inside the duration of your training, at the very least it'll be difficult and probably quite dangerous. Adam sat quietly and ignored whatever route Wood was taking for some minutes. I'll need to think about it, he decided eventually. Good, Wood nodded. If you'd jumped at the chance, I'd have turned you down on the spot. You're going to need to be sensible, not impulsive. Test passed, huh? Wood laughed. You passed that one, yeah, he agreed. The decision's not going to finally land on you for months yet. I just wanted to give you time to process it. Adam recognized the trees and rail tracks outside the MEPS as they rounded a corner. So what are we doing for the rest of the day? Wood sniffed a little amused noise. More tests, he said. Everybody present? Very well. Adam straightened. The MEPS had a little ceremonial room, decorated in wood paneling and rich blue carpet with a selection of flags at the front of the room on a little dais. He'd been handed a little card full of instructions and the oath of enlistment as he entered, and had taken the time to read it. Some of the others hadn't. Now there was an officer standing on the dais, getting their attention. Gentlemen, he said, you will shortly be called to read aloud the oath of enlistment as written on the card presented to you. There is an alternative secular version printed on the reverse of the card for those who prefer, and I'd like to remind you all that the First Amendment of the very Constitution that you will now be pledging to, support, and defend, guarantees the right of all citizens to be free in their own beliefs. He surveyed them all. This oath is binding. Once you have taken it, you will have formally enlisted in the United States Air Force. So if anybody's getting cold feet, now's the time to say so. Nobody did. Adam flipped the card over, double-checked its contents, and nodded to himself, mentally preparing. The officer smiled. In that case, we'll be going in alphabetical order. Ares, Adam. Adam stepped forward. Would you like a Bible, son? No, thank you, sir. Then raise your hand and recite the oath. Adam did so. I, Adam Miguel Angel Ares, do solemnly affirm that I will, he checked the card, will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that, he checked the card again, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to regulations and the, uh, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. By my word am I bound. The officer extended a hand, smiling warmly. Welcome to the Air Force, son. Thank you, sir. He stepped over to where the officer indicated and waited, not hearing as Himura Daniel was called. There was no going back, now. Date point. Twelve hours later. Lackland Air Force Base, San Antonio, Texas, USA, Earth. It wasn't exactly nighttime when the bus arrived at Lackland AFB, but the sun was definitely down, leaving only a kind of glowing blue blackness where the stars would be. It was a warm night, 
far warmer than the early January climate he'd been exposed to in British Columbia and Washington. It felt more like Cimbrian, in fact, if not for the gravity. San Antonio in January had a lot in common with Folkfa in summer. How the hell big is this base? Somebody muttered after the fifth minute of the bus rounding corners and driving past darkened buildings. Adam guessed they were already being hazed, the bus winding around to disorient them and make the place seem bigger than it really was. He didn't try to say as much, just grabbed his bag, ready to leap into action the second the shouting started. And start it did. They pulled up outside a low building. The doors opened, and three men leapt up the stairs and began bawling threats and instructions at the trainees. Some of the smack talk was so absurd and witty that Adam almost wanted to laugh. He resisted the crazy impulse, knowing it would only get him into trouble if he did. He was the third or fourth off the bus lining up alongside the others. He'd learned their names on the way down, but right now, it didn't seem so important to remember them as to try and form a roughly straight line and set his bag down in front of him, upright against his legs. Trainee, you pick that bag up and hold it until I say otherwise! Feeling silly and self-conscious, Adam snapped out a, Yes, sir! and grabbed it, hoisting it easily onto his shoulders. Silly or not, whether or not it passed muster as a response, one of the other trainees snickered at him for it and promptly got rounded on him. Adam just stood there, staring directly forward and holding his bag, trying not to attract any attention. A face was suddenly inches from his own. You play any musical instruments, trainee? it demanded. No, sir! The face disappeared. There was a lot of shouting, much of it, not insulting, but certainly calculated to shake any illusions he may have had about being confident or ready for this. He tried to stay focused in case any of it was directed at him. The fact that nobody else rolled up and roared at him suggested that he succeeded there, and it wasn't long before they were balled into filing into the building, assigned their seats at deafening volume, told to stand up, told to sit down. Adam could focus on nothing other than making sure he heard and obeyed any order that was directed at him, responding to them as well as he could. It wasn't long before he found himself at a mess table with a tray in front of him. There wasn't much on it, a sandwich, a bag of potato chips, and a small carton of orange juice. The sandwich turned out to be frozen solid, the chips were plain and unsalted, and the juice was watery and unpalatable. He forced it down as best he could anyway, polishing off the chips and juice before he was halfway through the sandwich sickle. There followed a gauntlet of paperwork and questions, being handed things, having things taken off him, being shouted at for reasons he couldn't quite fathom, responding with reflexive apologies or acknowledgments. He managed to retain which training flight he was in, at least. Not that he had a choice. He was forced to repeat the information so many times he doubted he'd ever forget it. It almost came as a surprise when he sat down on the bus to the dormitory and found that nobody was shouting for a few quiet minutes. What the shit have we got ourselves into? The trainee next to him muttered rhetorically, sotto voce. Adam didn't answer. He just gripped his bag and waited for the next order. Out of the bus, lined up, given a few rules, into the dorms, picking a bed. He spent five minutes with his fingers pressed to his locker, repeating the number on it until the knowledge was carved into his brain never to be forgotten. It was the only moment that stood out of a blur of orders, instructions, and beratements. He spanned through a cold shower in seconds, liquid soap in hand. Get wet, step out to let somebody else use it, lather up, step back under to rinse off, all the time being screamed at to move faster, faster, faster. When the blur ended, he was lying in bed wearing uncomfortable new clothes and listening to the others around him try to get comfortable. He was pretty sure at least a couple were fighting back tears. Plenty, he knew were repeating that same question to themselves that he'd heard on the bus. What have we got ourselves into? Adam didn't wonder. Twelve hours of travel and the emotional jolt of leaving Ava behind had taken so much out of him that he was the first to fall asleep. Date point. Five years after Vancouver. Folk the colony, Cimbrian. The far reaches. Ava Rios. Banging on the door summoned Ava out of bed and she threw on a bathrobe to answer it. Cimbrian didn't exactly have a postal service so much as it had Logan Brown, one of the school kids who took it on himself to hand-deliver any parcels and letters that came through the jump array on any given morning. "'Morning, Ava,' he chirped, handing her an envelope covered in USPS stamps and with the slightly worn feel of having traveled a long way in slightly careless hands. As soon as he was gone, she practically shredded it in getting the envelope open and sat down to read." It wasn't a long letter, but even so, it had a rushed, shaky feel to it. Adam's handwriting, unsurprisingly for somebody who'd grown up never really needing it, had never been neat, 
but now his scrawl was only just legible, and that with some concentration and puzzle-solving. Hey, Ava. Not going to lie, this sucks. I mean, I knew it was going to, but damn. It's like a movie in here. I thought those movies were bullshit, but we just get yelled at and bullied and told we're stupid, and it doesn't make any sense. Everything's so weird, too. Everyone looks the same. Same haircut, same clothes, same everything. If they weren't all taller than me, I'd think I was looking in the mirror everywhere I go. Powell was right. I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. I'm tired all the time. I keep being yelled at over nothing like they yell at me for not eating enough. Like, what the fuck? I'm full. How do you expect me to eat more? There's no room. Shit, they just told me I've got to put down the pen. I love you. Don't worry. I'll be okay. It's just crazy around here. Love, Adam. It made for tough reading. She went to school in a low mood. Date point. Five years, one week after Vancouver. Lackland Air Force Base. San Antonio, Texas, USA, Earth. Adam Aries. All right, trainees, this is your morning wake-up call. I want you out of those beds and at attention before the end of this sentence. Get up, get up, and stand at attention. Responding to the daily indignity of being shouted away could become a reflex, and Adam was already scrambling out from under his blankets by the end of the word trainees. It was only around about the word beds that a horribly familiar pressure in his boxer shorts finally infiltrated his awareness as his morning wood made itself known. Several of the rest of the training flight had noticed and were fighting to keep a straight face, while his own face slowly turned pink. Not for the first time, he regretted accepting the first bunk he'd found, right next to the MTI's office, because there was no time for it to go down. Technical Sergeant Lake was already progressing down the room on the lookout for anything he could criticize. He paused by Adam, who swallowed, awaiting the humiliation that was surely imminent. But instead, Technical Sergeant Lake's voice was calm and quiet, amused even. Trainee, you have my sympathies, but you need to be standing at attention, he chided, very gently. So you do that and you don't worry about anything else. Yes, sir, Adam choked out and forced himself to stand fully upright thanking the Lord that nobody, nobody, could possibly have remained hard in these circumstances. Technical Sergeant Lake, who was always thought of and referred to as Technical Sergeant Lake, and addressed with the loudest sir that the trainee could muster, nodded and carried on, leaving Adam to compose himself. The next trainee was unfortunate enough to be making a desperate little chewing motion to try and keep a straight face, and Technical Sergeant Lake rounded on him like a terrier on a mouse. Trainee, do you find this amusing? He demanded, screaming the question at most an inch from the culprit's nose. The luckless trainee's expression sobered instantly. No, sir. Were you perhaps trying to get a good look then? Is that the first time you've seen a war horse trainee? Adam's eyes shut themselves of their own accord just for a second, and he knew that his face must have gone as red as Tabasco. If the whole base had been hit by a meteorite at that moment, he would have welcomed it. N no the trainee began. I did not order you to speak, and if I had, I would expect you to sound off like a man, Technical Sergeant Lake roared. Front-leaning rest position! The trainee instantly hit the floor and held himself there, ready. Technical Sergeant Lake directed a glare around the room that could have boiled steel. If anybody else cares to comment on your fellow trainee's gift, get it out of your system, he ordered. Nobody so much as twitched. Outstanding! Trainee! He addressed the young man on the floor. Push the earth until I say otherwise. He turned to check on Adam, whose composure had now recovered somewhat, grunted and strolled through the dorm, taking his time over it. Make your beds, he ordered, then to the trainee on the ground. Trainee, recover! And since you're so enamored of our war horse here, you can help him make his bed first. Jump to! Adam threw himself into the chore, grateful for something to do. The relief at being able to finally get started with a day's training rather than dwell on his embarrassment was huge. By the time they had showered and there was food in front of him, he'd almost completely forgotten that it had happened. So, hey, Warhorse. Adam's bunkmate was John Burgess, and the two had bonded quickly over learning that they shared some San Diego experience. Burgess had lost family to the big one, the quake that had crippled the south side of Los Angeles in the aftermath of the detonation when their house had collapsed. He'd been one of the few who had managed to keep a straight face that morning. Ah, fuck, you're not gonna start calling me that, are you? Hey, man, it fits. I mean, damn, you're a fucking grower. This prompted a round of laughter. 
catcalling and good-natured hollering, while Adam was yanked back to the morning's embarrassment with a cringe. Oh, fuck, come on, really? He protested. Burgess just grinned. I'm just saying, man, no wonder your girl writes you so much. Oh, fuck you, man, Adam told him, though it was said with a smile. No, please. Burgess threw up his hands in mock defense. I wouldn't survive. You're one to talk, one of the others chimed in. We've all seen you in the shower. The fuck are you smuggling in that sack? Grapefruits? Man, they ain't that big. Adam snorted. Like fuck they aren't. You used to pitch for your school team, right? We should start calling you baseball. Burgess frowned at him. No, he asserted. Too fucking late, brother, one of the others asserted. You call him War Horse, you get baseball. All's fair in love and war. There was general snickering at that one as the newly christened baseball wilted. Shit, he declared. Adam laughed, being able to share the experience of an embarrassing nickname was taking some of the sting out. Guess we'd better get used to it, he said. Date point. Five years, one week, and four days after Vancouver. Folk the colony, Cimbrian. The far reaches. Ava Rios. As Cimbrian's population had ballooned with the influx of Byron workers, the school had expanded with it, hiring a second teacher and splitting into three grades, the oldest of which, for the time being, consisted solely of Ava. It was a bit lonely at the top, but the lack of distraction had allowed her to really focus on her studies. Still, she was grateful for being checked up on. Jessica Olmsted had assumed responsibility for the middle group and mostly left Ava to educate herself, intervening only to recommend a syllabus and make sure that everything was going well. Mostly what lessons she gave to Ava these days revolved around study techniques and how to learn and self-organize rather than conveying subject-specific information. Is that another letter from Adam? she asked, sitting down. Ava nodded. Yeah, he gets to send me one a week. This is the fourth one. Logan delivered it on the way into school. It's a shame you can't have phone calls. Yeah, I really miss just hearing his voice. Ava looked at the letter, longingly. Could I? Jessica asked. I mean, not if it's too personal, but I'd like to know how he's getting on. Ava nodded knowing that Adam's letters never contained anything embarrassingly intimate, and she slit the letter open with her fingernail, unfolding it onto the desk. Hey, Ava, she read aloud. I think I'm starting to do okay now. Our T.I. said on, like, day one that if he was using the word stupid, it's because we're doing stupid stuff, and that's really started to sink in now. I'm starting to get it. Things aren't what you'd call easy, but we've kind of gotten into the rhythm now. There's no time to stop, everything's all go, there's no downtime, and... And whenever I get to feeling like I really want just a few minutes to relax, we just get pushed harder and it turns out I didn't need the break after all. Nobody's allowed to hide in the back and let it all happen to other people. I thought I could at first. Like if I just shut up and did as I was told, I'd breeze through this and not get yelled at, but that doesn't work because they still pick up on what you're doing wrong and fix it. They don't let us just coast along. It's all push all the time. And now I actually kind of enjoy being yelled at now. Is that weird? If I'm being yelled at, it means I fucked up. She stopped reading and shot a glance at the younger kids. Ah, uh, sorry, Jess. Jessica giggled. It's okay. Go on. It means I blanked up and I don't want to blank up. Being yelled at means the T.I.'s got my back. He wants to help me not blank up in future. So when he yells at me, he's helping me. They've made me guidance bearer. It's kind of cool, but I have to carry this thing on runs and salute with it, and it's heavy as... She cleared her throat as blank. That's my 15 minutes. Lots of love to Dad and even more for you. Love, Adam. Jessica sat back. Wow, she said. He sounds different already. Yeah, Ava agreed quietly. Are you okay with that? Ava folded the letter again. I guess I have to be, she said. Jessica inclined her head. Ava had sounded genuinely philosophical rather than resigned or bitter. What do you mean? There's... Ava sighed and sat back, running a hand through her hair. Like, there are so many things I can't change. I sure as heck couldn't change Adam's mind about this. If I could, he wouldn't be Adam. So what's the point in not being okay with them? That's... true, I guess, Jessica conceded. 
Yeah. Ava looked down at the letter. There was a sharp tap as a wet patch appeared on it, and she scrubbed furiously at her face. Ava, if you need some time alone, Jessica offered. This earned her a brave little smile and a head shake. I'm... No, I just need to... To focus on the things I can change, that's all. Okay. You let me know if you need anything, okay? Ava just nodded her gratitude, set the letter aside, and returned to reading the textbook she'd chosen. Jessica went to make herself a cup of tea and didn't return until she was absolutely certain none of the kids would see that she'd been crying. Hey, Ava. Big news. I got told today I'm going to be honor graduate. There's so much I'd like to write here about what I've been through. My head just feels full of ideas all settling into place at last. There's just no way I could cram it all into 15 minutes, so I'm not even going to try. It's so weird. Week zero feels like it was yesterday and like it was years ago at the same time. I wonder if you'll even recognize me. I can't wait to see you. I've missed you so much. It's going to be unreal seeing you again. Adam. Date point. Five years, two months after Vancouver. Lackland AFB, San Antonio, Texas, USA, Earth. Ava Rios. Okay, I can't see him. Ava gave Gabriel a teasing smile. You don't recognize your own son? She asked. I'm looking right at the guy carrying the flag at the front of this flight, and that's not my son, I'd swear to it. It's Adam, she promised. Right height and build, right face. He moves differently. There was a deep-throated chuckle from Gabe's left. It's cold marching, mate, Powell told him. The captain had declined to share his reasons for attending the graduation, but in any case he stood out less than Ava would have guessed. He wasn't even the only non-U.S. uniform present. In any case, Powell had a remarkable ability to stand still, watchful and quiet, and slip people's attention when he wanted to. He was scanning the few hundred trainees in the parade with a cool, level stare that took in the details. Your lad's an airman now. Gabe frowned at him. He's still the same person under it all, though, right? Even better, Powell said. Trust me, he's the same bloke under it all, but he'll be sharper now, more confident. Probably in a bloody good mood, too. Gabriel looked back and squinted. Ava guessed that he was trying to connect the buff, buzz-cut creature of precision and intensity in front of them with some earlier vision of Adam, most likely the wiry, shy guy from school that she'd first started dating. Those two people didn't seem to have a lot in common, but it was definitely Adam. She'd spent too long staring at that face to mistake it. Do you think he can do it? She asked Powell. Pararescue, I mean. The captain nodded. He can, he said. That's not to say he will, mark you, but he's in with as good a shout as anyone can have. What happens if he drops out? Personally, I'd bet against that, Powell commented. But if he does, he does, and I'll bloody respect him for giving it a go. There's plenty else he could do, and all of it would be a bloody walk in the park after dropping out of the pipeline. I guess it's better to know where your limits are and acknowledge them than fake it. Ava guessed. Powell bobbed his head a little, indicating yes and no. True, but you can't fake it with that kind of training, he said. That's why it's so hard. But your fella's got a Superman button, miss. Poke him the right way, and he'd spit in God's eye to get the job done. I reckon if his trainers know their business, and I'm bloody sure they do, they'll have figured that out already. I never knew. Gabriel said softly. They both looked at him. His eyes were shining with a mixed bag of pride and something else that Ava couldn't quite identify. Powell clapped him on the shoulder. Only the beginning, he promised. Gabe acknowledged that with a nod and didn't comment further. So neither did Ava, nor Powell until the parade was done and the gathered airmen had been given a rousing congratulation and freed to see their families and visitors. Ava took first dibs on greeting Adam, throwing herself into an enthusiastic hug that turned out to be like tackling a wall. He hadn't grown in size much, but Adam's muscles had clearly toned and hardened under that uniform, and he lifted her as if they were still on Cimbrian. 
he murmured into her ear. Miss me? You know I did, she replied, and kissed him. Gabe interrupted them by hugging them both. I hardly recognize you, he said. It's the haircut, right? Adam grinned. And the body language, all that stuff. Gabe replied. You move more like he does. He jerked a thumb over his shoulder at Powell, drawing Adam's attention to the older Marine's presence for the first time. Adam hastily extracted an arm from the hug and saluted. Powell returned it but said nothing, indicating with a wry expression and a tilt of his head that Adam should focus on his family first. They fussed over him for a few minutes longer before Gabriel finally suggested that Adam should discuss whatever business it was that Powell had brought with him. He, in turn, was then dragged into the discussion by dint of being Cimbrian's security chief, leaving Ava to stand alone for a little while. Adam even listened differently now, she noticed. Feet shoulder-width apart, hands clasped behind him, attention totally on whatever it was that Powell was saying. So, you must be Ava. She was being addressed by another new airman, a young, acne-scarred African-American man who offered a hand to shake. Warhorse said a lot about you. She shook it. Warhorse? Your boy Adam there. That's his call sign. He never mentioned that. Eh, he hates it. The airman grinned. Did he mention me? John Burgess. I'm going into the PJ pipeline with him. Yeah, he did, Ava nodded. Nothing but good things. I hope so. Motherfucker took the top bunk over me for eight weeks. He laughed, then self-censored. Uh, sorry. Bleep. It's no problem, so... Warhorse? Couple of reasons. Your boy can carry anything. He's strong as shit. Put a bag on him, and he'll run all day. So we could have called him Pack Mule, but... You know, with a name like Ares. Makes sense, Ava agreed, grinning. Now the other reason is... God damn it, baseball! Don't you tell her! Adam returned in time to gently clamp his hands over Ava's ears. She giggled and wriggled free. Oh, come on, man. I've got to meet the girl brave enough to take you on. Ava frowned at him, ignoring whatever it was Adam was so desperate about. Brave? Burgess grinned. You know, the pants monster. Your boy here's Morningwood damn near took my eye out from across the room. Wh wow, really? She'd seen Adam naked before, of course, but that had been swimming, and he hadn't been at anything like full. She censored her own mental film reel. Baseball paused, then grimaced. Ah, shit. You, uh, didn't know? Ava shook her head. Adam just glared. So you two haven't... Now both of them glared. I'll, uh... Burgess backed away, pointing generally over his shoulder. I'll see you back at the start of Indoc, brother. I'ma kick your ass worse than the P.T., Adam warned him, though there was a hint of amusement under the warning. I deserve it, Burgess declared and left them in peace. Adam snorted and caught Ava's gaze. She was studying him with a grin of her own pulling at her cheeks, threatening to burst out into laughter, and it started to pull even harder when her eyebrows raised themselves at him. He cleared his throat. He's exaggerating. Her eyes flicked downwards. Guess I'll just have to see for myself sometime. She allowed the smile to finally break out in full, once her back was turned. Never mind the uniform, the haircut, and the precision. His expression in response to that had been pure, old-school Adam. It was good to know he was essentially still himself. Adam Aries. Gabriel was treating them to dinner while Powell had made his apologies and jetted back north to return to Folktha. Adam and Ava sat together in the back seat of Gabe's rented SUV on the drive into San Antonio proper holding hands and talking quietly. Okay, so why baseball? She asked eventually. Couple of reasons. One cool, one embarrassing? That's pretty much it, yeah. Adam nodded. Burgess can throw. Says he was pitcher for his school team. And when we were practicing with dummy grenades... Yeah. And the embarrassing? Baseball... For more or less the same reason I'm Warhorse. I don't have to draw you a picture, do I? She laughed. Please don't. We're here, Gabriel announced. He'd pulled the car into the parking lot of a steakhouse called The Barn Door, which he'd looked up using the excuse, when in Rome. 
It didn't take long to seat them, in a low-lit corner with a good view of some rodeo photographs and the two-foot flames on the grill. So, Gabriel broke the silence once they were seated and glanced at the menus. That was basic, huh? Yeah, Adam agreed. Weird, it seemed really hard at the time, but now, I mean, I'd find it easy if I had to go through that a second time. Eager to get on with PJ training? Adam smiled sheepishly. Dreading it, he said. But yeah, I said to Powell when he tried to warn me about it, you know, people do pass it, and it'll be tough, but I'm going to be one of them. Their waitress showed up. Get y'all some drinks, folks, she asked. Iced tea, please. Gabe requested. Coke? Adam asked. Sure, and for you, honey, she asked, addressing Ava. Diet Coke, please. Okay, y'all ready to order, or do you need a few minutes? They looked around, determined that they were, and ordered the 24-ounce porterhouse for Adam, a catfish filet for Ava, and the tenderloin for Gabriel. She gathered the menu. Okay, my name's Rose. If y'all need anything, just make eye contact, and I'll be right over to help. Drink's coming up. So what happens after Indoc? Ava asked, once Rose had gone. Airborne training, survival, diving, mountaineering, medical training. I mean, she interrupted. After all that, too. Are you going to be on Cimbrian, or? Maybe, Adam said. I've got some career choices coming up, and if it all goes right, then hopefully I will, but if I'm not... You two will just have to figure it out. Gabe told them. Their drinks arrived and they chatted amiably about Cimbrian and the progress of the reclamation project. Ava was in the middle of explaining how Byron Group planes were soon going to carpet bomb the scar with saplings and seeds in shaped canisters that would embed in the ground and then rot away, spilling Terran plants into soil that had been hugely enriched by the same fungal and microbial action that had killed the native flora and fauna when the main courses arrived. She boggled at Adam's stake. Where the hell are you going to put that? She demanded. Adam just grinned and tucked in. I'm a food vacuum nowadays, he said, and devoured a cube of medium-rare beef. Gabe clicked his tongue disapprovingly in the side of his mouth. Enjoy it, amigo, he chided. Take your time. I am enjoying it, Adam reassured him after swallowing. That's why there's so much of it. Ava giggled then stood up. I'll be right back she said, and vanished in the direction of the ladies' room. Adam was still watching her backside when Gabe tapped him on the upper arm. Hey, Adam, man talk for a second while she's gone, okay? Adam blinked at him. What's up? I love you both very much, right? I'm hoping for a future where you two have got a couple of beautiful kids and... Dad, shut up and listen, man, Gabe sighed. That's just what I want, okay? If you want different, fine. But tell me honestly, if you're serious about her, then that's the kind of thing you need to think about. Are you serious about her? Totally, Adam said firmly. Good, because she's serious about you too. Gabe nodded, though his expression was still concerned. Just be careful, all right? You're looking at two, three years of only getting to see each other every other month on a long weekend or something? That's going to be difficult. We know. We talked about that. Adam promised. And? And? Adam trailed off, then shrugged. Adam, I'm proud of you right now. But don't be dumb about this, okay? You can still be honor graduate and all that stuff and still fuck up your love life. Don't. It was Gabriel's turn to pause, searching for the right turn of phrase. Don't forget to... Dad, she's tough. We've talked this over together, and... We'll get through, Adam reassured him. I know she's tough. You both are. I just... Gabriel sighed and gave up. I just hope you're both as tough as you think you are, okay? I don't want you to wind up hurting each other. We love you too, Dad. Gabe gave him a sidelong hug. Good to know, he said. I just needed to get that said. Adam nodded. It's heard. But I'm sure we're fine. After everything that's happened. You never heard about the last straw that broke the camel's back, amigo? Adam frowned. She said she can cope. That's good enough for me, Dad. 
Gabe sat back with an uncomfortable expression. How? He began, then paused. She... Adam waited for him to finish, or even get started. In the end, Gabe just shook his head and hugged his son again. All right, amigo, if that's good enough for you. Date point. Five years, two months, and three weeks after Vancouver. Dominion Embassy Station. Earth, Moon, Lagrangian Point One. Seoul. Dr. Anis Hussein. So, this is Cruzir. The Kortai ambassador raised a hand. Not quite, he revealed. The directorate was dead set against the idea of your species acquiring the original Cruzier drug. In fact, we are now discontinuing it and strongly advise that should a sample of the original fall into your possession, you should destroy it. We will take that under advisement, Dr. Hussein assured him. Though, in that case... What is this on your desk? A derivative. Specifically designed for the human market with the intent of avoiding some future pitfalls. What pitfalls? Maidra inclined his head in a strange way, as if reading something only he could see. Used correctly as a topical or therapeutic target injection, rather than permanently marinating the patient's system in it, Cruzier has no side effects whatsoever. None, he revealed. It is, I dare say, a masterpiece creation of the Directorate's biolabs. That factor alone was sufficient for our anthropological researchers to take exception to giving you access to it. Hussein frowned. I don't follow you, he said. Where is the problem with a medicine that has no side effects? Maidra mimicked a thin-lipped, prim smile. Doctor, if I have learned one thing about your species these last few years, it is that, if dirt were edible, you would all be obese. I see. No insult is intended, you understand. You are from a dangerous world. I can only assume that to use and stockpile resources as rapaciously as you do was a necessary survival instinct for your genetic forebears. As a medicine, though, Hussein protested. We are not satisfied that it would remain a simple medicine. You already know of the one nicknamed the human disaster, which means in turn that you also know how to synthesize cruzier in industrial quantities. All you need is a sample of the drug itself. Major gestured oddly. It took Dr. Hussein a second to recall from his studies of alien body language that the gesture indicated concern. We fear that cruzier injections and patches would become commonplace, even the norm, taking an already imposing species and making the pinnacle of your physical potential trivial to attain, rather than a lifelong pursuit which precludes the study of other more cerebral endeavors. Hussein considered his Korti counterpart for a second. You make it sound like you want us to remain below our potential. Your potential, Doctor, is already intolerably ahead of any other species, Maidra countered. If some semblance of balance and fairness are to be retained for the rest of us, then you must either be encouraged to remain below your potential, or else encouraged into isolation. The failure of that latter strategy is why the Directorate has appointed me. To remind you that you need to be kept down. Maidra had at least perfected the knack of returning a human stare. Most aliens instinctively looked away. Or shall I point to the ecological grafting you were performing at great expense on Symbrian to remind you of that fact? I believe you just did. Indeed. Maidra picked up the file on his desk again. This version... This cruzier derivative contains a limiting factor. Resistance. Over time, any human who regularly uses it will steadily, but slowly, become increasingly immune. There are a few other changes mostly designed to prevent the drug from being synthesized by your symbiotic bacteria, but suffice it to say we feel less uncomfortable releasing this for you to use than the medicine for which you have actually asked. There will be no more human disasters with this derivative, 
He gestured out the window toward the earth, from the L1 point where the Dominion Embassy was anchored. It filled a respectable portion of the sky. I believe your ancestry comes from a region responsible for the myth of a jinn, Doctor? Close enough, Hussein conceded, diplomatically refraining from commenting that, as the Holy Quran had it, jinn were perfectly real. According to that myth, the jinn would grant wishes, but would twist the wishes according to a literal interpretation of their wording, to the wisher's detriment. He offered the file. We, doctor, are twisting the wish according to a sensible interpretation of its intent, to the wishers and our own mutual benefit. Hussein considered his options, then gave up and took the file. In that case, he said, having read the trade agreement and been advised on it, we accept the terms. They shook on it, gently. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this one today. Thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you for listening and watching as always. Um, if you wouldn't mind going down and uh, hitting the like button, also commenting and subscribing, that really helps the algorithm pick me up and get more videos out there. So, yeah, thanks so much for listening, guys. Um, if you would like to also go down into the description and click the Patreon link, you will be given uh, access to, you know, first viewing of all content, uh, actually, some... <clears throat> Patreon exclusives and things like that, all sorts of good stuff, not to mention Discord roles and everything like that in the Discord, uh, and access to channels over there as well. So again, guys, thank you so much for being here with me. If you could, please, tell me, how many times have you thrown up? I have thrown up a lot. I have, for various reasons. I've done it a lot. But yeah, see if you can count how many times you've thrown up. I'm going to go ahead and say that the number of times I've thrown up is somewhere in the 20s. I don't know exactly how many, but yeah, guys, um, you have a great one, and I will talk to you all later. I love you guys. Bye, y'all.